everyone. Pastor Jeff here with some thoughts of grace. What does it mean to be balanced? Now, I've heard that word used several times in various different aspects of life. Everyone wants balance. And a lot of times, people really don't know what that means. They know they want it, but they don't know how to achieve it. Now, I knew what balance meant in football. It usually had to do with my footwork. If I had too much weight on one foot, then it would be easy for my opponent to move me to a place where I didn't want to be. Now, in your Christian life, if you have too much weight that is being focused on one thing, especially if it's the wrong thing, then our adversary, the devil, will be easy for him to locate us to a place that we didn't intend to be. Now, in continuing this analogy of what balance looks like, I'm going to use something that is one of my favorite things in the church, and it's this power strip. Now, this power strip has been in the church for a long time, and it has been all over the world. It's been in Mexico, it's been in Ecuador, maybe it's been to Venezuela, it's definitely been in Northern Ireland. It has served us well all over the world. Now you look at a power strip and it is connected to one source of power. And it has all of these outlets that have access to that power. Now each outlet distributes as much power to each device and to each appliance as needed. It doesn't give equal power to all of the devices. Now imagine if it gave as much power to your phone as to say a space heater. That could be disastrous. It wouldn't work out all that well. So balance in this case is not an equal distribution of resources. It's giving the appropriate level of resources to each thing that is plugged into the power source. A space heater will always require more energy and more power than charging your cell phone. And I think that is the case in life. As we're looking for balance, we have so many components in our life that require our resources, that require our energy. But balance isn't trying to, equal, to equally distribute our resources to each thing. Some things will always require more time and more energy, and some things will not require as much. It doesn't necessarily mean that our life is out of balance. What it does mean is, is that you are giving each component the appropriate amount of energy required. Francis Chan had a quote, and it goes like this. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding in the things in life that don't really matter. A few weeks ago, we looked at this verse. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at the love your neighbor part, but now I want to examine what it looks like to love Jesus with everything, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. What does that mean? Now some of these terms are used interchangeably in the Bible. A lot of the New Testament was written in Greek, and the word heart in the Greek can mean more than just emotion. It can include our thoughts, our will, and even the basis of who we are. So based on the definition, uh, uh, biblically speaking, we can, th we can use that definition to apply to heart, but we can also use it to apply to our mind and to our soul and to our strength as well. So it's really interesting for us uh, who speak English all of our lives to look at the original language the Bible was written in and see for ourselves what does this verse really mean. A lot of the words that are translated as mind uh, it, it can also be translated in heart in the Bible depending on the context. And I've heard the soul being described as the seat of emotion and thought. So again, a lot of these things can be interpreted as the other. Strength is usually something that could be derived from your mind and from your heart and from your soul. So when these things can be interchangeable in the Bible, what does it mean when Jesus lists each one as a distinct part of who we are? Many of the books that I have gloss over this list as self-explanatory. 
And in a way it is. The key of this verse is to love God with everything that you are. Pretty easy to understand. But yet, it's in the Bible and it's listed so I, I want to understand what each thing is because the Bible goes out of its way to list each thing. And so in my looking of this, I found that some of the other books that I have uh, got pretty cute in trying to make this passage say whatever it is that they want to say. And that's really the danger of looking at the Bible, looking at Scripture. We as human beings can go in with some preconceived notions and we can work pretty hard at twisting scripture to get it to say whatever it is that we want to say. So when looking at this verse, I think it is important to remember that these are four distinct areas in the same list. Jesus meant for these things to be different and not merely a repetition of the same things. It fits with the overall context of the passage where Jesus is acknowledging that we are to give God all of us. So let's keep that in mind as we look at this verse a little further. This verse divides the human life into four categories. And the first one that is mentioned is loving God with all of our heart. Now have you ever tried to equally love and commit to different people romantically at the same time? Any of you ever tried that before? It is difficult to manage and eventually one will win out over the other or both will not receive the sufficient time and energy required. It will not work. And the same could be said for our relationship with God. He requires all of our hearts, all of our love, all of our devotion, all of our commitment. He doesn't tolerate us uh, cheating on him with another lover. And that's the thing. We have all cheated on the one who loves us the most, but he anxiously pursues us anyway. The Bible has a passage that talks about a shepherd who has 99 sheep in his custody, but still pursues the one that ran away. He loves us so intensely that he cannot stand when we are not with him. That is an expression of his heart. So what does that mean for us? We allow Christ's example to change our heart. We accept his invitation to woo us. We listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who leads us to value and desire other things. The hard part of God changing our hearts is, is that it oftentimes takes work. We are so easily able to fluctuate from one emotion to the next that the temptation is to assume that when God changes our hearts, it will be as fast as our hearts fluctuate. And the thing is, is that those things are different. The reality is, is that changing our hearts takes time. And oftentimes, God needs to bring healing and remove poison from our hearts. The Bible refers to our hearts as a well, and if there is something unhealthy in there, then fresh water cannot flow out of it. You want to give God a pure heart? Then pray the way the psalmist did. Create in me a clean heart, and God will begin to purify the waters of your heart so living water can flow from it. I think a good step here is to examine whether or not one of these outlets is getting too much juice. Is, is your heart being pulled to one thing more than another and is that one thing God? That is something important for us to examine in loving the Lord our God with all of our heart. Now skipping to the fourth thing that this verse mentions, it is to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. The Bible says that a double-minded man is like a wave that is tossed back and forth by the wind. We have a very clear instruction of the mind of God and it is clearly written in scripture. We don't have to wander around looking for what is true. It is right there in the Bible. And unfortunately, and I suppose fortunately, depending on the context, 
We have access to so much information. With the internet, we can have any information we want at the palm of our hands. And so much so that our minds can get clogged with so much information and information like Francis Chan says, that really doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that much. So what, when we focus our minds on what really does matter, when we focus on what scripture says, and we allow scripture to change the way we think about things, it gives us a level of stability that we need, and it gives us the room to grow in our lives. And until then, we will always be tossed about. So love the Lord your God with your mind. Know who he is. Know what scripture says. And be convinced of the truth so that it can influences you the way you think about everything else. That is truly what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. The second thing that is mentioned in this verse is to love the Lord with all of your soul. Now, as I said before, the definition for soul can easily be connected to our definition for the heart and our definition for the mind. So since those two things are already mentioned here, why is this verse mentioning soul? What is it trying to say that is different from the heart and from the mind? It is saying something distinct here. It's saying something different. So what is being said? What does it look like to love the Lord your God with all of your soul? And I think it means to love the Lord with the very core of our being, with the very fiber of our being, that our identity is found strictly in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. And so when we take a look at what identity means and we take a look at what scripture talks about our identity being, uh, we see that what we think about and what we desire feeds into our identity and our identity also feeds into what we think about and what we desire. And so we see these things flowing back and forth into one another. Now the Bible says that we who are followers of Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. Uh, the old things, the things that we valued, the things that we thought about, our identity has passed away and we are given a new uh, identity. We are made into a new creation. Our identity rests solely in Jesus Christ. And now it is one thing for us to fake passion, to fake being passionate about Jesus Christ, to be gun ho We are all about Jesus. It's one thing to fake that. And I think we can fake that for a while. It's one thing to uh, do our research on the Bible, to really look into God's word and to think through theology. And we can fake that as well. But the thing that we cannot fake is, is we cannot fake who we really are. We cannot fake our identity. Now, oftentimes, our identity is revealed in times of inconvenience and in times of disappointment. Uh, a lot of times we can't fake through those moments. So maybe you didn't get that promotion. And maybe a loved one disappointed you. Maybe you have gone through any number of disappointments. Now it is okay for your heart to process and grieve through those disappointments. It is, it, it is okay for you to think through those things in your mind and to think through how those things could be avoided and what really has transpired. But I find a lot of times our identity takes us beyond those things. And so a question we need to ask ourselves is, are we wallowing in disappointment? Are we wallowing in grief because our identity has been shaken? We thought that our identity was in one thing, but because disappointment has shaken us, we find that really it is in something else entirely. Are you not able to get over it? Are you not able to move on because your identity tells you that you deserve better? So you're just so frustrated. You're like, I should, des I should be better than this. I shouldn't have to go through this. I'm so angry because I'm up here and I'm experiencing something that is really down here. 
Are you depressed because you're convinced that your identity will never allow you to rise above your current circumstances? That Jesus will never bring you any further than where you really are because your identity is found in something that is completely different. If our identity is truly found in Jesus Christ, it will both humble us and raise us up at the same time. And so if we are finding ourselves to be prideful, then chances are our identity is placed in something else other than Jesus Christ. If we find ourselves to be in a place of such despair that we find that there will never be relief, that there is no hope, no joy, no, uh, no laughter, then perhaps we are placing our identity in something that is different. Another one of these outlets is taking more power than Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, we take a look at Jesus. We found uh, him saying that the world is going to hate us because it hated him. The disciples rejoiced in hardships because Jesus experienced hardships and he also embraced hardships. It was his identity, so they took it as theirs as well. So our energy in loving God uh, with all of our soul is not determined by our failures and it's not determined by our victories. The Bible says that even when things are bad and even when things are good, we can be content and confident that we can face anything because our identity is in God Almighty who gives us strength. That brings us to loving the Lord with all of our strength. Loving the Lord with all of our strength is the choice to fully apply our heart and our mind and our soul to our present circumstances. It means God gets the very best of our energy, not just the leftovers. And a lot of these things in our mind and our heart and our soul, a lot of it is our choice, but it is especially true with our strength. Sometimes in life we will encounter a situation that is seemingly bigger than us. And oftentimes it will be bigger than us. It is why Jesus needed to come. There were things in our life that were so big that we couldn't overcome. So Jesus came to set us free. But the Bible says repeatedly that God is our strength. He will strengthen us. It says in Isaiah that he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. So loving uh, the Lord our God with all of our strength means that we are not swayed by whether or not we are tired. We are not swayed by whether or not something is bigger than us. We lean in, we charge ahead, we fight because the strength that we have is not strength that is found in our own power. It is strength that is given to us. And we use that strength to love God, to worship him with everything that we have. And we don't allow any of the circumstances around us to change that. Now, this doesn't mean that it guarantees us success. We will experience failure. It simply means that our failure is not, has not transpired by our unwillingness to try. We choose to give it everything that we have. That is what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our strength. Now, what does this look like on a Sunday morning uh, in, 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 our, in our worship service? When we sing songs to God, we are passionate. We are free to let, our, our, to let out shouts of joy and affirmation. Uh, now what does this look like on a Sunday morning during our worship service? When we sing songs to God, we should be passionate. We are free to let out shouts of joy and adoration. Our hearts should be on full display. We are so uh, eager to allow our hearts to be displayed in many different aspects in our life. When we uh, see a play that moves us, we are moved to tears, we are moved to laughter. When we see movies, we laugh, we cry. When we are in a stadium rooting on our favorite team, a lot of times we'll be moved to the point where we would jump up. 
we would raise our hands. We would say, yes! And we would say, go defense! We would allow our hearts to make us passionate about these things. And that should be the case on a Sunday, mor on a Sunday morning uh, worship service. We should allow our hearts to be free enough to give a shout of, ex uh, of, of adoration, a shout of joy. All of our celebration and cries of our heart should be on full display. Now, some of you might be uncomfortable with this, uh, the, but you have never done this before. It's not dignified. It's not serious. This is not church behavior because you haven't experienced this in church before. But let me encourage you that a lack of experience in this is not an excuse to hold back the love that God is due. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. Now another thing it means is, is that when we sing, we think about the words. Now music is emotional and we should allow it to uh, drive us to be emotional. It is okay to be emotional, but when we only allow music to be emotional, we miss out on the key component of our mind. So when we sing, we should passionately sing, not only because we are emotionally driven to do so, but because we have thought through what we are singing. We should sing because we are convinced that what we are singing is true. That is what it means to have our mind engaged when we sing with all of our heart and with all of our mind as well. Now it should also mean that we engage in worship, we engage in song because our identity is found in worshiping Jesus. Nothing can stand in our way or should stand in our way because we are worshipers of Jesus Christ. That is the core of who we are. And since that is the core of who we are, we should act accordingly. We should allow that identity to influence every aspect of our life, especially that moment when we sing songs to God. Now finally, what it looks like for us to worship the Lord with everything that we have is it means that we should be fully present. We don't zone out because it's not our favorite thing. We don't zone out because singing is really not something that we're comfortable with. We engage with everything that we have because loving Jesus means loving with all of our strength. Now what about the preaching of the word? We talked about singing songs to God, but what about when Pastor Doug preaches or when somebody else preaches at our pulpit? What about the preaching of the word? When the word is being preached, we desire to know what, he, what, what the word is saying. We are inviting the Holy Spirit to move our hearts when the word of God is being preached. We value it. That's what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our heart when the word of God is being preached. It also means that when the word is being preached, we come with an open mind. We don't come seeking to validate our own opinions or to have our own opinion, opinions being confirmed. Instead, uh, we take what is being preached, we take the word of God and apply it whether we like it or not. It is objective. It is taking a look at what, uh, uh, what uh, is reasoned and what is intellectually given in the word of God and allowing that to have our mind being transformed by what the word of God says. It also means that when the word of God is being preached, that we can listen with a sense of peace because we are hearing the mind of Christ. Our identity recognizes that this is who we are and who we are always meant to be. And finally, when the word of God is being preached, we actively choose to engage. We push through the distractions. We push through the, the comfortability of the seats or the uncomfortability of the seats and the masks and the content of the message and whether it has pushed our buttons and whether or not the delivery of the message is to our liking or not. We push through all of that and we give it everything we have to listen, not only to the pastor, but to the Holy Spirit as well. Now notice that none of this influences our worship in any way, even when you consider all the changes that have been made because of the coronavirus. There's no excuse. 
we can still love Jesus with everything that we are. So if you found that you haven't been able to enter in, if you found that you haven't been able to worship with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, would you consider the possibility that there is an outlet in your life that is taking in too much power, that has been taking in too much priority, uh, that is taking something away from the worship that Jesus Christ is due? Because Jesus should get all of us, no matter what stands in our way. No mask should stand in the way. No social distancing should stand in the way. He should deserve all of it no matter what. So if you haven't been able to enter in, would you ask yourself what is taking place, what is taking priority in your heart and in your mind and in your soul and in your strength that is prohibiting you from giving Jesus the love and praise that he is due? Now, you take a look at this verse. Of course, it extends beyond a Sunday morning. We owe this level of love and devotion every second of every day. It is big. It is huge. And so, because it is so big and so it's huge, you won't always succeed. But that's the beauty part of this, is that Jesus gives us grace even when we don't succeed. It is promised us in scripture that he would do that. So when we find ourselves falling short, we repent and then we continue on our path to love the Lord with everything that we have. Now this Sunday morning, Pastor Doug is going to continue our wisdom series. So please sign up to guarantee your seat. And there's going to be a link at the end of this message and it's going to be in the description of this video of what as well for you to click on that link and to sign up to guarantee your seat. Now, if you forget to sign up and you realize, oh no, it's Sunday night or it's early Sunday morning and I haven't signed up, please free, feel free to come by anyways. Oftentimes, we have extra space and we don't we don't want to turn anybody away who could worship with us and wants to worship with us. So if you find yourself thinking, oh no, I forgot to sign up, please come by anyways because there might be a seat for you. Now it's first come and first serve, and so we might run out of seats, so please go out of your way to try to sign up and please guarantee your seats. It helps us out too, but I pray that you would take advantage of this opportunity to worship Jesus with everything that you have by coming to meet us on a Sunday morning and joining us as we lift up praise to God together. Now, if you can't do that, if you uh, have uh, some immunity suppression issues, if you are uncomfortable with doing so, then you can check us out on Facebook Live at 11 a.m. and we will post it later on at YouTube uh, later on Sunday evening. So either way, we get to continue to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. So I hope to see you then on Sunday morning, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's in person. God bless.